Uh, I'm Sean Armstrong. Uh, I'm the principal, managing principal here with Redwood Energy, and we're specialists in all electric design. And I've invited uh, Johan Martinson of Transom, who is out of Montreal. He'll, um, you know, without explain himself in a moment here. But um, it, the request was, how do we replace a boiler that is servicing radiators or similar high temperature needs in a super cold climate? And you guys have heard that question. I'm going to let uh, Johan answer it. So Johan, take it away. All right. Welcome. Well, Thank you so good. much. Oh, very good. Thank you for having me. So uh, I was wondering, can you hear me and can you see the screen? I can hear you perfectly and I can see the screen. All right. That uh, sounds good. Well, I promise you I'm better at chillers and heat pumps than I am at Zoom calls. <laughs> that so, was my fault, not your fault. No, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're here to talk about the uh, like air source uh, replacement for boilers at very low temperatures and f reaching full uh, temperatures uh, so you can retain the piping and radiators and fan coils and so on that's existing in a building so it becomes a component replacement project as opposed to a system replacement project. So doing that and uh, foam climate uh, boilers is one name. Another one is low carbon hot water systems for decarbonization projects, which is a mouthful. Johan, there's a little bit of like muffly banging sounds. I'm not sure if you're like okay. you're touching your microphone or anything, but just so you know. Right. Is this better? Or? I think so. It's just, if, if, you're, if there's any way that you're touching the microphone, just make sure you're not. Right. Yep. I'm holding it up now, so. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, just to, to give a little bit of background, uh, we do um, a number of things. The heat pumps here at your source or water to water in here, but we do um, uh, water source heat pumps and chillers like this for reclaiming. Uh, we do air source or air cooled uh, chillers. And uh, all these items up here are modular. So we can do up to 10 units or 12 units of each one to get to about a um, thousand tons of uh, cooling. And then we also do uh, small uh, trench chillers, which are, you know, everything for microbreweries and um, manufacturing processes and so on that needs that like a bakery we just got an order for uh, costco for instance a little two-ton unit uh, then we have a uh, 100 percent makeup air unit that relies on uh, heat pumps so we go in and uh, use the exhaust air as the source temperature for um, the heat pump so that uh, we have heat reclamation for part of it and then the rest of it we do with the uh, heat pump but even at very low temperatures, it's very temperate inside the, uh, the unit for the heat pump. So we get good uh, replacements on that. Then uh, we also do specialty units. So we have, uh, this is a high precision for lab. So we do variable speed compressors, uh, tandem and staged, so that uh, we were able to hold uh, within 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit uh, temperature on the evaporator. And then we also do pump skids up to four or 5,000 GPMs and down to about 10 GPMs on that. So, but it, we're here to talk about the, the hatch heat pump and the, the applications of it. So as mentioned, we do have two versions of this. Uh, basically the controls and electronics all stay the same, but uh, it's the, you know, the source of the unit that varies in there. And uh, we can wear, vary it a fair bit on the applications. So uh, one of the things that really comes in when you try to do air source heat pumps is, you know, the, the compressor is the heart of it. And uh, the, uh, the manufacturers, they put out a operating envelope that they've tested out. And if you operate inside of it, then everything is good. The, the performance is okay and the warranty is good and all that sort of thing. And if you step over the edge and you go outside, you're kind of on your own, but you're, um, it's not like a cliff that you fall off, but it could be uh, you know, adverse if you stay out there for too long. So uh, we try to go through and figure out what can we do with this envelope. And one of the things here you see, it's kind of like a rectangle. We have the uh, source temperature down here and the leaving water temperature up on the Y axis. And this corner, the upper left-hand corner is chopped off and the same thing on the lower right-hand corner. And uh, one of the things is that this line is the constant line of 
a pressure ratio for the compressor. And the compression ratio is basically your discharge pressure divided by your suction pressure in absolute as opposed to gauge. And that's uh, basically how much work the compressor is doing. So it really doesn't know what it, from where to where it's going. It just knows I've got to push this hard. And it's almost akin to if you're going up uh, in a high rise, you know, three flights of stairs or eight flights of stairs is just more work. And uh, if you think of this line here, if you're down at the low evaporating temperature and low discharge, and the same thing up here where you go up to a higher source temperature but a higher discharge, as long as you follow that line, the compressor sees the same pressure ratio. So it thinks it's about the same. So when you get up into this corner, that pressure ratio starts getting pretty high and you're getting up you know, past uh, 10 uh, pressure ratio. And that's where uh, the internal uh, temperature goes very high. You get premature uh, oil degradation and this sort of thing. So it's not a, a, a good area for that. And the same thing down at the bottom end, it's such a small pressure difference between the suction and discharge, you don't get proper oil flow and so on in there. The seeding of the compressor is what, what we're after. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. And of course, we want to be up here outside the, where there is no operating envelope. And that's uh, basically where we're going to figure out how to do that and be effective of it. Uh, one of the other things is looking at the different refrigerants is finding ones that are good for the various uh, high leaving water temperature. And it comes back to what's the critical temperature of the uh, refrigerant that you want to choose. And depending on what you're after, you choose different refrigerants. So it's not a one size fits all. So we have our uh, envelope in here. And uh, the, the typical area in here, we, we call it just 15 degrees. We'll get to the low temperature in a, a little bit here. But just as a reference here, we'll go through and uh, have it a 15 degree Fahrenheit uh, source. And uh, if you're doing a new build or something like that, you can do uh, about 120 degrees, which isn't too bad a, an operating envelope. But if you're doing uh, domestic hot water, you're up at 140, 145, this sort of thing. And of course, what we're looking for replacing uh, the boiler uh, is up at the 180. But overall, we're well outside this operating envelope. So you try to uh, keep that going there. Now, we looked at different types of compressors and the manufacturers, they um, have many different flavors so that they're pro to low temperature versus high temperature and this sort of thing applications. So for this one here, there is a number that can have overlap on that. When we get up to the domestic hot water, there's other ones in here. And uh, we get into things like uh, economizer circuits and this sort of thing to help out uh, that range. Then um, if we really want to go up here, uh, we've been working with uh, reciprocating compressors. And one of the advantages of reciprocating compressors is that they're a variable VI uh, compressor or volumetric ratio. So that means that uh, the volume of the gas coming in and the volume of the gas going out varies with what the pressures are. A scroll compressor is a fixed VI, so it has a, the volume at the inlet port when it closes off versus when it opens up to the discharge stays constant, it doesn't change. But with a reciprocating compressor, it's basically you pull down the piston, you fill it up with gas, the piston starts up, starts compressing it. And on the outlet, you have the reed valve that basically holds down the, the compression chamber. And on the back side of it, it's the discharge pressure that's pushing back against it. So when the pressure on the inside of the piston starts getting close to that discharge pressure, plus a little bit more to push against the reed valve, then it opens up. So you always get the perfect amount of uh, compression of the gas as for whatever applications you're doing. And, you know, if you're in the middle of the road, like in here, it's not that critical. But when you start getting up to the top end, that's where it starts making a bigger difference. Now for a scroll, it, it's not terrible. It's just not as uh, accommodating for these wider ranges. So that's why with the reciprocating, we have a very wide operating envelope on this. So if you think of a regular uh, heat pump, 
we have um, the uh, source temperature it's coming out here, whatever that is. And we take um, an outside uh, source temperature in here, pull it in, and um, we'll go, oops, I have backwards there. So we go in and uh, then uh, reject the heat into the condenser and it brings it around. So in here, we get so much energy from the outside air. We get so much work from the compression of the uh, compressor. And then uh, this is the rejected heat that we have up there. And that's the, the work that we gain. Now, when we want to go to higher discharge, one of the things is the pressure enthalpy envelope um, starts curving over. So it's not linear. And when you go through this, it's the amount of subcooling that stays constant. So the more you go up, the further to the right you slide. And if you remember your enthalpy uh, pressure curves here, uh, the amount of enthalpy gain is per pound of gas. So when you go here, you start getting less and less uh, difference on this. So you pick up less refrigeration uh, effect from the outside air. You've got to do a little bit more work and then you only get so much out of it. So you kind of get a double hit on that one. So then um, the next one is now we take this from a, uh, a lower source. So when that goes down, now we reduce the, because it curves in here, we reduce the amount how we get out of the uh, uh, coils, the outside air, and we have to increase the amount of work that we do. And that's where we come up here and then we reject that heat. So your efficiency starts dropping off. So uh, then uh, the other factor of this also, sorry, is the um, uh, density of the gas goes down. So for the same swept volume, it's a constant volume compressor, it uh, pushes through less pounds of refrigerant, which makes less capacity out of the same uh, system. So when we get down to these low systems, you might have a, a 20 ton system to get a uh, maybe a five ton capacity out of it if you go very low. So basically we go in there. So it's, again, the subcooling remains the same there. So to try to get more uh, effect out of the uh, outside air and get more heat of rejection, we basically increase the subcooling. And in a lot of cases, because we're doing the outside air, we're producing 120 degree or 140 degree water or so, or 180. Uh, we can um, use just a, a straight air coil that will, after full condensation on the condenser, will generate uh, that much uh, more subcooling into it. Can the you other factor. Pause just to define subcooling. Oh, uh, define subcooling? Okay. Yeah, so uh, when you uh, come in here, the, the, when you evaporate, you have to make sure you get 100% vapor on the outside. So you, the uh, outside air boils off the refrigerant plus a little bit, so make sure it's all vapor. Then the compressor builds it up and uh, compresses it up here. And uh, if you think of uh, the wintertime, if you have condensation on your, your window, uh, because it's steamy inside, it, the cold air on the outside window condenses that. So the condensing uh, for a refrigerant is just a relative thing. So it's very hot for us. But for refrigerant, it's very still very low. So we go in and we cool it off until it turns 100% liquid again. And when we do the subcooling, we usually do like five or 10 degrees subcooling on a regular basis, just to make sure that there's no bubbles of, of gas in there, of refrigerant gas. So when we do this, now to stretch out this air, because it's the enthalpy from this spot to that spot times the mass flow that gives you your Capacity. We basically use, think of it as like turbocharging the refrigerant that's in there. So we stretch it out further and then we let it go through the evaporator. But it's so cold that it steals more um, heat from the air on the outside. And that way we get more uh, capacity uh, out of the same system. So this could be instead of 5 to 10 degrees, might be 50 degrees subcooling. So it's a, a fair bit of uh, subcooling on it. And it doesn't do too much to the system. Uh, it just means that you got to right size your TX valve to uh, accommodate that flow for that capacity. 
another version of this, if you don't have a uh, source for doing the uh, air cooled uh, subcooling, is uh, you do it refrigeration wise. So you take part of the refrigeration that you pull out of this and you have an extra little evaporator. So on one side you have liquid refrigerant that's going out to the uh, uh, coil here. And uh, on the other one, you use like say 10% of your refrigerant, small TX valve, and you boil it up and then you subcool the refrigerant and uh, have uh, an additional 30, 40, 50 degrees subcooling. Now with that, you end up with uh, basically vaporized gas and the compressors they use with it, they have a vapor port, they call it. So they have the regular suction port and part, it sort of takes in the suction gas, starts compressing, and then the vapor port opens up and that's where we squeeze in the uh, vapor uh, gas and then it compresses it some more and it goes out through the discharge. So it's two different ways of doing the same thing, but the net effect is the same of that. But lots okay. Uh, Sorry, I, what was the question? Sorry, uh, Bruce Nagel had unmuted himself accidentally. Um. Okay. All right, so then the, uh, the other um, uh, thing is, that say for a large uh, high rise, like the New York uh, application, we end up with, um, you know, quite a wide variety of load, right? And I think of a gas boiler, uh, it can turn on and off that valve uh, as much as it wants to match the load that people are using. So then it you know, becomes very easy to uh, maintain that temperature. So now with a heat pump, one of the things is that with a compressor, you have to have a minimum runtime and a minimum off time. So you don't overcycle the compressor and burn out the motor or have nuisance trips. This sort of thing. So um, often what's, what we do is put in uh, multiple units. So instead of large units, we have sort of a few smaller ones. And that way out of each one, we can get two stages. So this would be six stages of unloading. And uh, we, it works off a, a dead band. So that as you have your set point, say in our case, 180, it would come up and we would say a plus minus one degree. It would bring it up, it would cross over the line. It would sense it and say, okay, we're getting too hot it will stage off that one, uh, one of the stages. And then it starts a dead band timer. That's about uh, five minutes long. And it checks to see after that time, is it below or above the um, uh, dead band layer here? And if it's still above, then it starts another, or it takes off another uh, stage and waits for it to come down here. Now, when it gets down to the bottom, there's a low end of the dead band and it gets too cold. So then it will turn on one stage and do the dead band timer and so on. So with these systems, you can have many uh, modules to match up to what you need, but uh, it gives you very good uh, temperature control out of this. And after six stages, it's fairly level. It's not too bad. So uh, that's what uh, we do there. The other side of uh, air source heat pumps is what you do when it gets warm. Because all the problems that you had at the low end, you, your capacity is coming down and you basically have to oversize the heat pump to get the capacity out of it that you want. The flip side is when you get to the you know, shoulder seasons and this sort of thing, your heat pumps are gonna generate a lot of uh, capacity. So with those, what we can do is basically we have, um, the staging of the various uh, units. Then um, we can uh, turn on and off the economizer to lessen the capacity of that. And the fans are variable speed, so we draw less air across the coils to basically affect the suck, suction pressure and so on. And then uh, depending on the, the application and, and temperature ranges and so on, there are variable speed compressors available, but it, it kind of, within a certain range of temperatures. So these large ones, that'd be a hard one to get into. So doing that. The other thing with uh, heat pumps is we end up with having to do defrost, of course. And uh, what we've done with those ones is in the coils, we have uh, embedded heating rods 
similar to what you have in a walk-in freezer or refrigerator uh, at a place. So um, we end up uh, basically when we go to the defrost cycle, it will uh, uh, stop the compressor, stop the fan, and start heating up these electric uh, heating rods that are embedded in the coil. And basically, we, every so often, we leave a tube of refrigerant out of it so we can put in the, the rod. And it raises the temperature a lot faster, and it um, uh, generates the heat without putting cold water into your system. Because usually you do reversing valve, uh, then you kind of undo some of the heating that you just did. So again, the technology is not new, it's the application that's a little new. And because we go higher temperature quicker, uh, the uh, defrost cycle should be about half of what, what it is uh, in conventional systems. So now we're, we're coming into this. Here's a variety of uh, the compressor envelopes. And we've gone through quite a number of them from pretty much all the major uh, compressor manufacturers. So we've gone through like uh, Emerson, Bitzer, uh, Danfoss, Toshiba, uh, to, and with a variety of gases and so on to see what could we do and, and so on. Uh, even looked at propane, but unfortunately they, they only come in so large a capacity. They have a very good range but they only come so large so that it wouldn't help a high rise. So in here, you can see all these. And of course, uh, if you take two uh, bin data here, this is for Vancouver or the West Coast. They look very good there. And then this is for a Buffalo. It's kind of stretched out and they go a lot lower. So taking those temperatures into control or into account, that's where we're trying to fit into this and see where we are. So depending, you're on your application and so on, there's different solutions that you want to do for this. So if you're doing boiler replacements for say Vancouver, you got very good selection of uh, pieces you can do. Domestic hot water, you get other ones in there. But uh, if you want to do just preheat to go lower temperatures, then you can't go so high if you want to have a single uh, system in there. And then you can also do, we have a lot of uh, process ones where we have kind of spill heat or low quality heat that we can draw from and then we can generate a lot of high temperature in there. So just for, to, to clarify, yep. oh yeah, you're getting there, but this is, yep. you said um, specifically you can't do it with one system. And I guess you're about to talk about how you do it with two of these boxes here yep. or something like that. Right. right. Yeah. So, so it, what, yeah. <laughs> okay. So what we have here is the, uh, the minus uh, 30 application, which is, uh, you know, fairly low. And uh, of course we want to generate 180. So now we're way up here, away from all these here. And you can see even with all the different compressors, this sort of chopped off corner kind of remains constant for all of them. They can slide further down and, and lower temperatures here, but then they can't go as high. Or the ones that do it very high can only go so down, down so low. So that's a, a variety of, of things in there. So if we look at this, the two main ones that we have in here is this yellow low temperature one and the higher heat recovery one. So they are two scroll compressors. So if we do that, again, uh, we try a cascading system. So when we do that, come in at minus 30, and, but we only raise it up to about 80 degrees. So we come in here, this is our operating point here. Then um, that's our primary system. So then we go in and we take that 80 degrees as a source temperature for the second circuit. And that's where we can raise it up to 180 out of those two. So we can't do it up here with one uh, circuit, but we can bring it along this way to uh, keep within the operating envelope of those. And what effect does that have on your COP? It actually, um, yeah, I've tried a, a number of different ones. So you took this ratio, you know, we can bring this further down and we can take this one or bring it further up. And it's almost like you take the same pressure ratio and it's basically, how do you divide it? Do you put it 50-50 or 60-40 or how do you want to do it? And uh, for all the ones I did, the COP 
only changed very small, like within two, three percent. Uh, it wasn't a very big jump. I, I was a little surprised myself. I would have figured that the closer you were to 50-50, it would be a beneficial. And it was, but only so much more so that uh, it doesn't drop off that much. So it's more looking at what's your range of your systems and what do you want to do with it and so on. So that, that would and be it. You have a, if you were, say, doing this exact job of a crazy polar vortex, which really might only be a day, so just an evening, right. and you got to negative 30. But just in that most extreme circumstance, which is less than 1% of 1% of a year. But when that mm. happened, what would be its COP when going from negative 30, say, up to 180? To set about uh, what's the low it, yeah in in round numbers uh, these two here with the fans i didn't refine the fans but say it would be about 2.4 to 2.4 uh two somewhere in awesome. there that's fantastic yeah is that that would be running two compressors at that cop though right you would yeah, no it would basically so the thr you generate here basically just becomes the source temperature for this one, so you don't get anything for it, right? So all you can do is figure out how much uh, total heat of rejection you get out of the second stage. And then I took in the uh, wattage from this compressor and this compressor and put them together, and that's when we got those higher numbers. Wow, that's pretty good COP. Yeah, and I, uh, I, I just kind of guesstimated the fans. Uh, I didn't refine it too much, right? Now, uh, up on the secondary system, it's a water to water, so there are no fans, so that's fairly straightforward. So, doing that. And uh, it, it varies. And then out of this, but it's um, uh, like in this range, one of the things I saw was that you need about four of these guys to supply the heat for one of these guys at this low temperature. So, the, this would be a very small package, if you will. Um, out of that, but uh, it, it does, would work fine and no problem. So one of the things we'd be doing is that on this primary circuit, that would be the air source here, and we would generate, you know, 80, 90 degrees. And then from there, that would feed into the secondary loop, and then that would generate the building loop uh, out of that. <clears throat> and one of the other advantages out of the two is that these are relatively small compared to the uh, coils up here. So, uh, excuse me a second here. We, um, if you wanted to, you could put them in and uh, put these water-cooled ones inside a mechanical room on the roof, for instance. So that will allow you to have your building loop uh, stay as water. You don't have to have the glycol uh, running throughout the building and doing that. So the, this becomes your uh, a bit of a buffer loop up there that you can draw off in this one because each one's got different stages and so on. So it's not a, a perfectly flowing uh, uh, matching between the two. They kind of stage off on that. So that, that would be uh, the system. And out of this, now you can take this, and again, we can do up to 12 of these in a row for uh, a system in there. And um, I think we're up at about uh, uh, 250, 300 uh, MBH uh, out of each one of the sort of secondary loops of that. So if you think you had a million BTU uh, boiler replacing, you might need three of them out of that. So uh, one of the other things that uh, has come across uh, in a number of projects we've done on this, this is, uh, the reference is uh, Vancouver here, but uh, when they looked at how low do they design for it, and their design load is 15 degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, they're using uh, instead 25. And what happened with that was that if you go from 15 to 25, your actual output is about 34% uh, more because your density is more uh, out of that. It drops off very quickly. So now you put that in into this, and uh, out of the yearly long heating cycle, 
the from 15 to 25 was only 63 hours. So if you took that, it was 0.7% of the season, um, do the average for the range, it was about 0.1% drop in the uh, capacity of the generator of that. So then they looked at, we, do we do that with electric boilers? Because in here, it's not that the system won't work, it just won't give you your design load. So you can pick your design load anywhere along the way and it just reflects on how big is your installed uh, sort of capital cost and so on of, of the system. Because uh, if you shoot for the very, very low end, then you um, uh, really have to have oversized equipment because of the sweat volume and the density to meet your capacity. And then for the rest of the year, you'd be substantially oversized. So those are some of the things just to look at on there. There's, there's no no right or wrong. It's just what is that project uh, compared to another one. You know, so like if, uh, for instance here, this one was very uh, capital sensitive, which not many aren't. But uh, with this going from 15 to 25, they basically were able to do with two machines instead of three. So then uh, here's uh, another one that's uh, domestic hot water. Actually, I should stay here. Is any questions on this or on this loop? I have one question. Go ahead. Uh, one question you mentioned early on about being able to essentially slide up the temperature scale a bit. And so with this example here, where you're going from negative 30 to 180 Fahrenheit, yes. would it be possible to go from uh, negative 10 to 2 or or from 10 Fahrenheit to 220 Fahrenheit, or does that exceed uh, performance? Yeah, so that, that would be uh, up here if you go into this. Uh, this can get, get us a, just over 180, about 183 or four degrees or so. Uh, so the compressor can run higher to about 190 something, but we leave a little bit of buffer. So the, these envelopes here is the water temperature that, that we're generating through that but it would be very high for that one. But if you go back to this one, we could get up to 200 with the reciprocating compressors. They, they would be able to achieve that. But it would be from here about 30 degrees on that. So that's uh, uh, basically limitations of the mechanical systems and the compression ratios and so on of the of the gas that's in there. And we looked at, you know, propane and all sorts of other things, CO2 and this, this sort of thing. It's not, um, e each one has a trade-off. So it's not a, a straightforward, uh, easier decision than other ones. So. I had, a qu I had a question just to make sure I'm following. Um, so the, the compressors are not new technologies, but the controls to make the step that's new, right? Yes. If you took, uh, it's a very good question of, if you took each part and chopped it up, it's very sort of traditional to technology that's been proven out before. It's the repackaging it for this application that makes it work. Uh, and that's the, the new part, if you will. So like the embedded uh, coils that's in there, uh, taking basically what's normally uh, refrigeration type compressors, like for uh, walk-in freezers and refrigerators and so on, and applying it to heat pumps. That, that would be another one there. So, so each one uh, in itself is not that, uh, that much. So the compressors, very standard uh, proven technology. So again, if, as long as you stay inside that uh, envelope, then you're okay. Johan, so. a question about the envelope, if you could keep the slide up. So um, I just wanna make sure I'm seeing it right before I ask the question. It, it, am I right in saying that, you know, around 10 degrees Fahrenheit and lower, the leaving water temperatures are in the 130 degree range? Yes, it's kind of like um, those are the things that are available on there. So the, uh, there, there are compressors that have kind of that 
transition period mm -hmm. uh, or area. But often they're very small capacities, like one ton, two ton, this sort of thing. So for a high rise, it would be very, very large. I, the, and then the, uh, on the converse or the opposite end of the spectrum there, I, I think of my experience visiting friends in Manhattan in the winter and being roasted out of their apartments, <laughs> 180 degree discharge, uh, you know, 180 degree radiators. Um, so my thought was on the sort of more, more moderate temperature side what kind of opportunities does like the classic outdoor reset temperature reset offer you like another way of saying you don't need 180 degree discharge temperature when it's above you know 45 degrees I mean, oh yeah no that, that's very true uh, so if you're like what you're saying is on this one here we would uh, have this on a very cold day but then you could slide down to about 180 um or sorry, 180, 170, 160, and so on, to not have to work it as hard. And as you go down, if you remember the start, those pressure ratios are going down, so the compressor is doing less work, so then your COP is better. And it, it uh, because we're at, at the sort of outer edges of it, it's kind of like a, a almost an exponential, not quite, that you're working hard for it. You can do it, but it's a lot of work. So if you can step in a little bit, it uh, really makes a, a big difference. So that, uh, yes, very much on that one. So uh, we did one project uh, was for a, a school in uh, Joliet, Quebec, and uh, it was a technical school and they had gas boilers. And one of the things in Quebec is they got very low cost electrical power and gas is very expensive. So they were trying to do away with uh, using the gas boilers. So they put in uh, these uh, air source heat pumps, that, or actually the water source. So they dug up the football field and that was their loops for um, the source, but it was still only so big. So our source temperature was 28 degrees. And, and then uh, it would go from there and we generated 160 degree water. It was one of the things they did in their study was that uh, at that time, you know, getting to 180 was, uh, there wasn't much, uh, uh, available back then. So uh, we generated 160 and they worked it out that they could heat the school with 160 instead of 180, the traditional one, right? And, um, you know, if you had a boiler and you do 180, you don't have to worry about it, right? But now that you are working for it, you can do 160 and they found that the piping was big enough in the radiators and so on that it uh, basically uh, heated the school they would get little longer runs and so on out of it but uh, it would uh, keep up with that and then uh, the other thing they did with it was the, the the peak load shaving so that when they uh, the electrical power usage from the uh, heat pumps and so on got up too high they would cut them off because uh, one of the things with the school was they had a, a welding class so they had the resistive welders you know whole classroom full of them so when uh, you were there working on the unit, uh, all of a sudden they've been working away perfectly, no problem, and then they start staging off and you wonder what's going on. And that was, you know, because class started up in the welding and uh, the BMS system kept track of it. So it would stage off the, uh, the uh, heat pump uh, compressor motors and uh, leave that uh, maximum uh, power usage flat. And then when the class was over, they would come back on. And in that period, they had uh, the gas boilers, because we were already installed, were um, uh, picked up anything that was uh, uh, sort of missed from that period. So then um, they would uh, run through that. And one of the things was they had a, a lease on the uh, gas boilers and they had to use so many cubic meters per year to maintain the rate that they were paying for it. So doing this used up enough gas that it paid for the year also. So they were very close, you know, sort of looking at what they were doing. And uh, the sort of the end story is that they looked to squeeze wherever they could, but they didn't try to maximize, you know, one technology and do 100% with it. It was a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And out of that combination, they got the most out of it. 
Now, most of the work was the heat pumps, but uh, trying to push that last corner to, to get from, you know, 96% to 100% would be a, a substantial jump. So just what you said there of trying to manage your set points and temperatures and so on, that would be a, a big part of it. So, or, or get more efficient welding equipment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, uh, you had Tom Gervais. I, just one question. I think on the next slide you had the uh, schematic of the units, and you were saying it was about two hundred thousand BTUs. Uh, was that for that? You know, for everything on the screen there, the three air source and the two water source. You're figuring that that bundle there is about two fifty. Yeah, actually, it was uh, three of these and one of these. I just oh, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. And say like this one here, it might be a, a four foot cube, you know, so it's not huge. For sure, yeah, no, no, no coil for the air, right? Yeah. And, and just and, to emphasize uh, that, and, Johan, you were saying that could go, like you could have a small one in an apartment, you could have a bigger one like up on the roof. The, these water source heat pumps, it sounds, if I understood from our previous conversation, they're somewhat flexible in where you put them. Yeah, so it's a, uh, so what we do is basically we have a basic design and then for each application we can twist and turn and make it a little different, right? Like say often we make these like a little cube, but say you want to get into a, a, a penthouse mechanical room in the building, we can make the same refrigeration components, but we make it like a vertical, like a skinny vertical one so you can get up through stairs and elevators and so on and doorways to get it in. Uh, so that would be one of them. And then what you mentioned also is having a source temperature through the building and individual smaller heat pumps inside the, each apartment so that each person can be in charge of their own um, the sort of uh, heat level that, that they put in there, how many BPUs they get. So that would be it there. But you know, another one would be uh, having a a bypass valve or a three-way valve for each department and a, uh, a thermostat that might work well too. So that, that's neat. There's a two different individual unit controllable strategies that you just listed as well as a whole building strategy. Right. Yeah. And coming back to, you know, doing the outside air temperature uh, compensation, uh, our controllers, that's what they would uh, take into account in the first place, the staging of it and the temperatures and this sort of thing. So that can work out well. Um, there's a, are more questions, of course. Are you finished with your slides? I just want to make sure that you, you get through what you wanted to show as well as. Yeah, just a couple more, just a, a couple of applications here that we did. Another variation on this. So uh, domestic hot water here uh, coming in when you have a wide variety of sources, how to deal with it, right? And uh, coming in and you look down here, so at low temperature, uh, your capacity of unit is this. And as the ambient goes up, your capacity goes up, of course. So for domestic hot water, you run at very hot temperatures, right? So it's where do you pick what capacity you want? So these are different size units, the different uh, slope lines here. And this would be our, the design load for that. So if you can go a little bit higher, you can uh, keep that in there and have like straight electrical backup or something like that. But all you need to do is fill in this little triangle. So it's not that much. It's not that the technology doesn't do it. It's just where do you draw the line of what, what capacity you want at what temperature. And that uh, comes into it. The other one is uh, for hot water uh, usage. You know, I'm just speculating a line here in the morning, there's lots of usage, is uh, basically uh, preheating as much water as you can. So you bring it up to a high temperature. And then as you people use it, you use a blending valve to then make that hot water last longer. And uh, not having to size for 100%, you can go down to 75 or 80% of the actual load on that. So uh, we're doing that. Then we talked about this. I'll jump over that. So this is uh, another application we did was um, in Toronto. Uh, it's the new uh, 
construction method they're allowed here, six story buildings, all wood uh, structure. And uh, it was one 10 ton unit would go for the six tons. So it's mixed use, uh, stores in the bottom, then office space, and then condos on the top. And uh, there's two circuits inside with two separate uh, pumping loops. And they're, they're used to circuit A is basically switching from heating cycle to cooling cycle for the building. And they used uh, in water, in floor uh, loops, even for the cooling. And uh, the second circuit, when it gets very cold, would basically switch over and help the circuit A meet capacity. And the same thing at the very high end, circuit A would uh, be used along with circuit B for cooling the building. But then in the middle, you pretty much uh, wouldn't need the second uh, circuit to get your capacity. And we've talked about the higher source temperature and so on. So what we did with that one was we have a three-way valve and switch it over. So it would use um, that uh, uh, period for generating hot water. And uh, it was you know, about 80 to 83% of the year, the, the bin hour data. So we go on there. And the other one that we went through on that one was what was sizing on that. So when they wanted the, the minus five degree design point, uh, they, uh, uh, we could have this compressor, but we come up at about 96% of the load. And the next one up would be like 130% for the next size larger compressor. So it would be good down here, but when you get up to the upper end, when it's warm outside, it would be way too much capacity. So instead we just looked at this little wedge in here and uh, took that period for those hours and out of that, it was only 72 hours per year. And again, it worked out to about $7 of electrical. I took the electrical rate for Toronto, but $7 per year is this wedge. So you don't have to oversize the unit. <clears throat> and then uh, the other thing was at the very low end temperatures, they uh, relied on <clears throat> the electrical backup. But even there, the unit would still produce it on that. And then here's your capacity, full capacity. Remember those uh, economized reports? That's uh, the unit running without them. And then here's with one circuit on the two of them. Because the design is this, but probably your heat load is something like this as you go along <clears throat> on that. So that's where it was. And, and the big thing was, Squeeze wherever you can, not just one technology, 100%. And it, just to, to give you a little background here, so if we get a, a different temperatures uh, that you want to run at, you know, different locations, so on, uh, we go through the uh, um, different compressors that we can have and look at what's the operating envelope. So you see these ones here, we're kind of stretched out and we're outside the envelope for these. So we went and worked with this one here with an economizer and that covered pretty much all the operating range that we wanted. And then from that, we would go in and do the major uh, components. Uh, again, very standard products, but we would have to do an iterative process to balance them out. So the um, evaporator, condenser, compressor, fans, pumps. So we get a, a good balance on it for that application. And it might be a different refrigerant too, so uh, we'll go through that. Then uh, we do all our uh, controls, electrical panel building and so on. Uh, the controls are pretty much uh, all in there, uh, in the controller. And we just have a parametric menu that we set up that you choose, do you want this or that is a reversing, non-reversing uh, chiller or heat pump, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, Skinner, just you know, over in the chat, <coughs> Um, you had a question I wanted to make sure you heard. He was asking, what simulations have you used to size your hot water storage with particular sized heaters? Bigger the heater, smaller the storage and vice versa. The math is not as clear to me as it is, as it may be to you. So oh, his okay. question is, how, did, how does he do the engineering that you're doing? He's a PE also doing cold climate heat pump, water heating right. um, in upstate New York. Yeah, so we can, um... Uh, go through and uh, um, 
sort of looked at the tank and it's a, about the, the BTUs and the, the storage of it and so on. So the buffer and- Do you have a simulation uh, software that you recommend or are you using um, like Excel basically? No, it's, it's a kind of first person, so Excel. Um, a lot of times uh, it's the, the people that I work with, that's what they do. Uh, they build this sort of system and we, we bring this to the table and <clears throat> give them the tools that they can work with. Gotcha. So, There's an online simulator. If you go to ecosizer.com for domestic hot water, heat pump, uh, storage and heat pump sizing. Thank you, that's mm. some ecotope talk in there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, ecosizer.com. Yeah, that's right. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you can do that. Uh, then the other one is that we do uh, the um, sheet metal ourselves. We, we send out for the fabrication, but the design is that. So we mentioned uh, that, you know, low wide unit uh, for low profile if it's on the roof or a tall skinny one if it's indoor and you want to get it up a service elevator or a doorway or something like that. We can reconfigure the same functioning unit in, in different parameters. So that's no problem. Then we have a, a ERP system where we have a parametric design where the all the different sizes and so on are pre-made. So once we pick a size and so on, it populates all the uh, liquid line components and coils, fans, electrical, this sort of thing with it. So it, it makes the process work quite well. And then in here, we, uh, we have a test stand so we can run at all the different uh, voltages of so 575, 460, 208, 230, uh, single phase and three phase. And uh, we do run tests so we can um, go in and test all the units and run them before they leave the factory. And then our uh, manufacturing facility is uh, ETL certified. So we get audited every uh, three months or so and uh, come in and we keep records of it and so on. So, so that's what we have there. And then we're made in Canada. So. Woo! <laughs> All well right. Done, Johan. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, this is a time we'll go back I think to all, of, all of you have uh, speaking privileges. So uh, please unmute yourself and ask questions if you have any. Hi, my name is Brian Boyce. I was wondering if this equipment is rated to AHRI 550 or some other test procedure. Yeah, no, the, uh, that's the problem is that uh, because their size, the quick answer is no. So the long answer is that most of them uh, are related to fairly sort of middle of the road type applications. So if we size our units for that, it wouldn't do that well in the sort of lower source and higher discharge. So that's why we, we really don't do that. We, we can, uh, uh, what we've done the other ones is uh, do third party testing if somebody wants it. For, uh, have, have you ever explored the idea of working with CSA or AHRI to, to work on a cold climate test procedure specifically for your types of products? You know, it uh, tends to be a fairly new application. So it hasn't really gelled. I, I've, hasn't been too many sort of uh, common applications. Each one is slightly different, right? So, so say like we do these ones and then somebody wants to locate it in the garage. So then we switch uh, axial fans to blowers so we can duct it outside so you don't get short circuiting on the air airflow. And um, so that would sort of negate your, your ARI because even the, the shape and size of the, the unit. You have to do your 300 pound, pound bag of sand on top of it and not crush it. <laughs> so that, that's the, I think eventually, yes, but right now there's just too many, like a, most of the, the applications I do is kind of, can you do this? Can you do that? And so on. So, uh, you know, one was in uh, Vancouver or Oregon, which is, you know, fairly temperate, you know, sea level and so on. The next one I got was for uh, uh, 
these uh, Utah in, in sunshine, and uh, you know, high elevation and so on. So that took on a whole thing on its own too. But if you just kept the design together, you probably need a two times bigger machine to do the same thing. So for the applications, we kind of match the coil size, fan size, and evaporator to what the application is. Uh, hi, my name is Nick. I have a question. Um, do you all do any, um, or sort of what level of like applications engineering support um, do you give, or are you relying on the design engineer to sort of fully design and specify all sort of points of the system and then you just build it to order versus like more of a design build where um, maybe a, a contractor might say, all right, we have these ambient conditions and we need, you know, this, we have these loads and these desired water temperatures and then you could sort of design and design the system for them. Yeah, it's more uh, that one, the second one that you mentioned that, uh, you know, here's what we would like to do or here's what we have, you know, have to work with. You know, if they're an existing one they want to replace, they're stuck with these things. So it could be something as simple as footprint, you know, they only have so much space. So, okay, we work around that. So we can do that. You know, what's the size of their storage tank? How do they want to handle their, their uh, hot water system? That's a... Uh, all different ones there and is it uh, you know could be a domestic you know a high-rise or it could be a school or it could be a, a, a process you know that has very steep uh, changes in loads right versus most uh, comfort cooling is or heating sorry is um, fairly gradual changes so all, all those things goes into it so no it's not a you know Here's my catalog. Pick out what you want, and I'll, I'll coach. Got it. And then a fo follow up to that: um, you listed some refrigerants on one of your slides. Um, do you have any like low GWP refrigerant um, systems either in development or available? There's a large push to move away from sort of traditional refrigerants. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, it's becoming more and more available, uh, but it's. Uh, the, the testing, the availability of different uh, compressors and so on is fairly limited. So like one is using 449, for instance, uh, that's a, a good option. But um, uh, say like R32, it's, uh, you know, you can specify it, but there's only so many compressors that Emerson and Danfoss and so on have available. And then when you go to a lo location where it's going to be installed, not every distributor has uh, that available. It's almost like special order in and so on. So there are things with it and say like uh, from a heat point, heat uh, pump point of view, R32 has a very small uh, operating envelope. So we wouldn't be able to do this kind of jobs with that. Now the other one that looked at was propane, which has a very good high end and so on. So one of the things I did before is I, I manufactured uh, rotary vane compressors and, and uh, we used it with propane for um, uh, applications here in, in uh, West Australia where it gets very hot. So they had very high condensing uh, temperatures. So it works there. So, you know, propane is a very viable alternative to it. But um, you... Uh, um, you know, have to work with what's available. So not a lot of compressors are uh, UL certified for North American use using propane. So, and then explosive part of it. <laughs> so. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But it, we are looking at it. Sorry to, to finish off your question. Is we are looking at it and the more we can do, um, the higher end, it's uh, we're still up at you know using 134A is a very sort of good refrigerant from an application point of view, not from GWP that point of view. Um, and I, I'm curious if we're looking at one of these temperature ambient E0F transoms here, uh, how many pounds of refrigerant are in them? Keep in mind this is a closed loop system which you know, significantly yeah. reduces refrigerant. Yeah, so they, it varies, but uh, 
it say between 12 to 18 pounds per circuit. <clears throat> So we could do a little math on, since there's about three to 5% leakage of natural gas that just in the, the system of delivery, um, in domestic water heaters, just all the R134A leaking out of heat pump water heater is equal to the annual leakage rate of methane in the delivery system. So it, it's like, <laughs> on the one hand, heat pump water heaters rarely fail. And on the other hand, gas systems are failing every single day of the year nonstop. At three percent period. So I continue to advocate for us electrifying with the refrigerants we got, period, as fast as we can. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and keep on moving on the low GWP refrigerants also, but don't get in the way of electrifying. No. Um, yeah, I so say you can do a lot more by bringing up the bottom up as opposed to bringing the top up further, right? Are there other questions here? I still see there's like 35 people. I want to make sure you guys get your questions answered. Maybe somebody, this is Pete up in, uh, in uh, New York. Uh, maybe you answered it and I was in another world for a moment. Uh, sure. But uh, have you experimented with split systems that make it possible to uh, uh, get rid of the, of the heat exchanger and the heat transfer fluid that's antifreeze? in your primary loop. Yes, uh, I've done that before. And if it was ground source, you could do it. But with air source, it's such a wide variety of source temperature and the amount that you get out of it. So it's very hard to control the uh, ratio of the primary secondary uh, compressors. So okay. that, uh, like to, to take, so the, the water loop that's in there, is the buffer between, you know, if you think of doing uh, operation down here at minus 20, minus 30, and in the shoulder season, you're up at 50, 60 degrees, that it would be a very wide variety of, of these things. And if you had a ground source or some sort of source, a lake or something like that, your plus minus range is fairly small. And with the air source, it's a very large range. So to get that first compressor sort of be sized up so that it matches the other one here, that, that would be it. So, you know, maybe now with more VFDs and so on that you can do with the compressors, that's in there. But what I also noticed that the low source uh, compressors uh, typically are, are refrigeration and so on type applications, freezers and whatnot. And typically they're on the refrigeration rack and they're just on off compressors. So they're not built with variable capacities. You know, you might be able to get down to maybe 15 degrees or something like that up here. And, and that's where you can do variable speed, but otherwise that's about it. But the, the one thing I should say too, is that this application is still fairly new, you know, getting to these very different temperatures, right? And most of it has been comfort cooling and so on, the direct to air. So there is more and more compressors and so on coming available and so on. And most of them tend to be very small and then they're growing into larger and, uh, units and so on. So, but for a high rise to make it manageable, you need to probably a 20 or 30 horsepower um, compressor and the multiples of them. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else? This is your chance. This is Blake in the Sierras. I might've missed this. Um, how many installs do you have? Um, we're probably about uh, 16, I think we have on there. Great. Another case study. First of all, this is awesome. Thank you so much for presenting. This is like really exciting stuff. And thanks for putting this together, Sean. Um, are there case studies on your website? Um, no. <laughs> it's all good. I'm, I'm trying to keep up, but I'm not that fast. So. It's okay. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll look for them as they become available. Okay.
Yeah. Yeah. The one uh, weird one that was uh, in there was uh, uh, for Arbitoire. You know, we did all that's to put it in a pond and that was the source. And we generated 160 degree water and that's what they use for cleaning the Arbitoire at, at the end of each shift for spare washing. So many different applications. Right. And Matthias, I think you're next and then Bruce. Yeah. Um, huh? Let's see, are you going to be putting these slides up uh, on your website or something, or a presentation, because I think it could be very useful? I'm going to be, sure. putting, I've recorded this, and it's going to go up on Redwood Energy's YouTube site. So if we have a, like a pretty significant YouTube site for Redwood Energy that you can find. So that's where the, the presentation will be. Um, uh, Johan, I, you should say what you want to say about the slides. I could post the slides if you wanted me to, you know, why, how, how would you like to deal with your slides? Sure, yeah, I'll uh, put it together here. Just got to clean them up a little bit, so. Thank you, Johan. That would be a great, uh, a great uh, service. service to all of us. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. Bruce, do you want to say yeah. anything? Yeah, thank you for doing this. Uh, this uh, how did fun kind of engineering and looking at the various ways you're doing this. This, this to me looks, the yeah, analogy to this looks like the, the change in turbochargers over a period of time and people get better at sizing them. You're taking different units and sizing them in different ways. And um, you, uh, if you want to get this widely publicized, I think it's a bit complicated. And Bruce, hopefully you'll come, yeah. Bruce, your sound is really poor. You should just ask the question straight forward because I can't hear you very well. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll just leave it as a compliment. Good job. Great technology. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Great. Uh, Matthias, um, you wanted to talk again? Yeah. Can you uh, Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have to. Uh, preface my face with an apology. I wasn't able to, you know, follow uh, probably important parts of this presentation because I was <laughs> multitasking. I just had uh, questions. To what extent ha have we seen uh, numbers on COPs as a function of, you know, outside air temperature here? I um, I may have missed it throughout the presentation, but but ultimately that's a you know important question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we we looked at the like this cascading one. We're about uh, 0.2 to 2.4 uh, COP at uh, at uh, minus 30. At so minus 30. Yeah, yeah. 2.2 to 2.4. Okay, and and how about something? You know, imagine not Canada, but uh, you know, cold winters in the mid Atlantic. So take I don't know, 19 Fahrenheit or something like that. So that's probably for you guys easy peasy but uh but nevertheless uh at that slightly more moderate but 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 for for some reason you know still cold temperature what what cop might you get at at a outside air temperature of say i don't know 17 uh fahrenheit yeah so then you're uh, like say at the upper end you probably up about 3.5 or so uh when you get up to you know, 60 degrees out there. So it's fairly linear in between. You go through there. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, you, do you have a visual for a chart that you're referring to or, or which, which linear interpolation am I doing here? Uh, no, it, I, it's a, okay. Uh, I didn't put it in here yet. So. Okay. Okay. So, but yeah. you, so six Fahrenheit, you get three and a half no, for uh, COP? 60. Yeah, 60. Like say oh, in the shoulder 60. season. Got it, got it, got yeah. it, got it. I see. Yep. So then I can work it out. Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. You know, it's not a, an exact thing because the big, sorry, the, the other side of this is, you know, the, the efficiency, the, the capability, you know, first, can you do it? And then it's how well can you do it? And then how big is it? And then what's yeah. the cost, right? Yes. So taking all those things into it, uh, it becomes a big thing. So here being able to do the 180 from the, course is kind of a big hurdle right but as you go higher and higher on your source temperature as your design point mm -hmm. it allows you to pick different technologies different compressors smaller packages do it in one stage instead of the other one right mm -hmm. so you get to about uh, 15 degrees or so now mm -hmm. you can do 180 with one stage if you go to the recent compressors so 
Uh, so a question is how to get in touch with you, Johan. Um, I, it seems like, uh, well, first I encourage you to, to type your text, your email address into the chat box. That might be okay. Helpful. But I think sure. what I need to do is promise everybody that I'll send out a, to everyone who attended, right, a notice with the, the online YouTube recording and the slides and his email contact. Um, and, and probably give me a week, but um, go ahead and if you could type it in or, or I can type it for you, right, into the mm -hmm. chat box. That'll help at least okay. some people here. Sure. Transom. Okay. Um, so with that, I think that I, I, I'm running late for a meeting myself here, so I should probably uh, pull this to a conclusion if I can. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was good. Yeah, thanks so much. It was, it was great to, to see all this again, and boy, it reminded me of uh, uh, wonderful times in the thermo class back in college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Momentum perfect. heat and mass transfer. Okay. <laughs> um, Johan, what is your email address now? So uh, it's a long one. So it's uh, uh, my name. So J O H A N uh -huh. dot M A R T E N S S O N uh -huh. at transom, T R A N S O N, like Mary, uh -huh. corporation in full dot com. There. And I'll give you a phone number here too. It's 705-796-6240. 796, sorry. 796-6240. All right, folks. Please copy and paste that as needed. And I'm about to um, stop the recording here. So this is official.